Hey there, it's Bram Kanstein and this is Bitcoin for Millennials. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting app. This will help me reach a wider audience and educate more people on Bitcoin together with my guests. And in this episode, I'm joined by Cole Walmsley. He's the founder and CEO of Gator Capital, author of an upcoming book called The Bitcoin Thesis, a spiritual seeker and a super curious human who decided to skip college at 18 and instead move across the country to play professional poker. We discuss the transformative power of Bitcoin, the critical importance of understanding money, the halving cycle, the deep philosophy behind Bitcoin and how it combats inflation, giving us hope for the future. I hope you enjoyed this episode. All right, Cole Walmsley, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thank you, Bram. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks so much for your time. I uh, I just tweeted uh, that someone canceled and uh, I think uh, your friend and someone I follow, Jay, uh, tipped me that I should talk with you. So here we are. So we had a, a very quick prep, I think 20 minute prep. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, from the teams that, that you talk about, I see we will probably have, uh, we'll have a nice conversation. But uh, yeah, first, first, I wanted you to just start with uh, your Bitcoin journey. How how did that go? How did you get into Bitcoin? Yeah, my Bitcoin journey started from the investing side of things. I started investing in August 2020 in stocks and spent a few months there during the ultimate bull market after they printed trillions of dollars. And it was really the ultimate case of beginner's luck. But then at the start of 2021, I heard about crypto from a friend of a friend started looking into that a little bit moved all of my investment capital from equities into bitcoin originally but i didn't know what the heck i was buying i just saw it was going up into the right i wanted to get on board i was sweating my balls off morning night day because i didn't know what i was holding and it was so volatile which I've come to understand, of course, is a good thing, but I was scared to death. I ended up selling two weeks later, moved it into an altcoin. That went up a little bit. Later on that year, I moved into Olympus DAO, was the crypto project, DeFi Summer, total scam, Ponzi scheme, APY, nonsense. So I got <laughs> pretty, you know, I stayed, was able to stay afloat ultimately, but made a bad investment and got wrecked there, learned my lesson the hard way, sold everything at the start of 2022 and went 100% cash and decided to actually start doing research really on my own for the first time in the sense that I wanted to see what was out there and see what I believed instead of looking to see what other people believed and they were telling me what to believe. So I stumbled across this model that's still very under the radar online and to most Bitcoiners by this person on Twitter called DeFi underscore initiate. And he built a model around the habit cycle of the power law, and a couple of other programmed metrics as well. And it really stood out to me. And it talked about the having, the having cycle, which I was completely unaware of at the time. And there's these four year intervals. And I started to notice why are the bull markets 2013, 2017, 2021, bear markets 2014, 2018, 2022, it was March, 2022. And if that thesis was correct, we were gonna enter into a bear market. It had already kind of been heading that way at the start of the year. So I asked the first question. I was like, what is the having cycle? And I was down the rabbit hole forever. I ended up spending the next 11 months figuring out what Bitcoin is, and I'm still figuring out what Bitcoin is really, but I got to a level of conviction in January, 2023, where I finally invested into something and it was hundred percent Bitcoin and I haven't looked back since. Love that. Yeah. I think we are all still figuring this out, but I, I think yeah. you also see that now, right? This is such a big, a big shift that, uh, the, the, the rabbit hole runs fairly deep. I, I find it very interesting that you mentioned you know, you started playing with stocks, then you went to crypto and eventually you mentioned, you know, I started thinking for myself and studying and then getting the conviction on Bitcoin. And I find that such a mm -hmm. interesting team, right? Because the conviction doesn't come from someone else telling you, you know, this is a cool thing. You should invest in it. Right. Or, you know, Tesla is going to go up or what, you know, whatever the, 
the story is basically, right? Can, mm -hmm. can you share a bit how your thinking changed there? Because I think that point is something that a lot of people have, right? They play in the stock market um, or they play in crypto, but they don't necessarily understand what they are doing, right? They yeah. think they should be doing it because everyone else is doing it, right? Yeah. And I think the difference with Bitcoin is that once you understand what this is, you actually don't want any other people to buy it. <laughs> you know, you, you want more <laughs> for yourself, which I think is already a little paradigm shift in a sense. Yeah, I remember, I mean, yeah, even with stocks, I'd be on, I want to say it was called stock Twitter or something, and everybody's on there just pumping their bags on whatever investment they're holding. I remember I bought a penny stock because someone was just gassing it up and I was two weeks into investing. I had no idea what was going on. So I put some money in there and it went down inevitably. And I learned my lesson there, never to invest in the penny stock. But people would just pump their bags nonstop on there and I didn't know any better. And I got into crypto and started watching people on YouTube. This one account specifically called Crazy for Cryptos. And he was talking about how we were going to enter this mega bull run. And he starts talking about a hundred X's, a thousand X's and starts naming all these coins. And again, as a rookie, you know, really you're, you get a little greedy and you start chasing money and returns. When you see big numbers like that, you want to get on board. You want to believe that it's right. And so you kind of rationalize those things that you're hearing without truly believing them at a deep, deep level. So. That all changed when I actually started to look for myself and ask questions instead of kind of just having answers thrown at me without myself even asking a question. Yeah. So once you start asking questions, you start finding out answers for yourself and you're like, well, okay, I see this can be true. Maybe this isn't true. This is misleading. This is accurate. And, you know, Bitcoin is entirely based on proof of work and it's proof of work speaks for itself. And that was the theme since I started looking into it, it's been the theme since then, and it will continue to be the theme as long as Bitcoin is alive and well. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a different, the word really is conviction because I'm so convicted about what Bitcoin is because of the nature of it, right? Because it runs on proof of work and it's demonstrated as proof of work and it does every 10 minutes. And I don't have to worry about the company's earnings report. I don't have to worry about the centralized issue of a cryptocurrency changing from proof of work to proof of stake, doing X, Y, and Z. I can sleep well knowing that the, the Bitcoin network runs every 10 minutes on proof of work, and I can go and verify that for myself. And I know it's the largest computer network in the world, among many other things. And so I sleep like a baby now at night, and I sleep, I sleep really well. And it's just different when you, when you go and do your own research and discover things for yourself, it's, it's way different. It's like in school, right? You're told, you're told what to, uh, what to learn, essentially. You're force fed academic information and you go and basically cram it just to get a grade, but you don't really learn yeah. the subject. You don't really yeah. learn what's being taught. Yeah. So when you teach yourself, and there's different ways to do that, but really the best way to learn is to teach. And so when I started doing that, especially on Twitter and writing the book that I'm writing, my understanding was even taken to a further level and the conviction only increased as well. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key which are on-ramp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. On-ramp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. 
The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah, I love the point of uh, of proof of work, right? And that you... You said you sleep well, but I think I th- I, th- I think that's a that's a that's an interesting point because some people say like you know uh, Bitcoin is pure speculation, etc. And I always reply, well, you're also speculating that Elon doesn't die in his sleep, right? That he wakes <laughs> up I- I- in the morning, you yeah. know, or that there's no hurricane in your area code where I don't know you own a building or whatever. So the speculative part I think is nonsense, but it's kind of like the, that is part of the the fiat investing game, I would say, but the The proof of work gives you the security. You know, I think if we try to simplify that, I I had another conversation in the episode before this with Brad Rettler. We talked about what is the entire value of Bitcoin and we boiled it down to the set of rules that are proposed are actually followed and you can check that every 10 minutes. And that is the proof of work, right? Yes, the rules are still the same. The rules are still the same, you know? And if you think about stock, like companies that have stocks, right? They have, I don't know, a six month strategy or a yearly strategy or a five year strategy or whatever, right? Like those are the rules or that's the plan, right? That's what they write down. And eventually you're kind of betting on the fact that they will actually follow through, right? That they understand, mm-hmm. I don't know, what their market is like or that their new product is actually innovative, right? Or that they fix their supply chain or whatever, like all these elements. And I think that is what can actually keep you up at night, right? Is this a good CEO? Is this a hostile board? Or yeah. <laughs> like all, all these things. Whereas with Bitcoin, every 10 minutes, and you said, you know, you can check for yourself, you can check for yourself with your node. Are the rules still the same? Yes. Is the monetary policy still the same? Yes. You know, like that, that is the entire, I think, value eventually that Bitcoin brings. That is also why it eventually could be the base layer of everything on top, because it, it is eventually so overly simplistic and i also think that's why it's so hard to understand right (laughs) it's just a set of rules and every 10 minutes we say it's still the set of rules you know that's that's it yeah that's that's spot on bitcoin is the least speculative asset on the planet because we don't have to trust something we don't have to speculate we can verify everything the code is open source The entire network runs on proof of work. It's proof, right? It's proving that it's working. The people that support the network are proving their work that they're dedicating to supporting the network. And all of that can be verified by us as market participants. Whereas we have to trust a CEO to make the right business strategical decision to move their company forward and outpace competitors. We have to trust again, like in Ethereum, we have to trust a Vitalik to not move the network from proof of work to proof of stake. Yeah. When you remove trust and you bring in verification, it's like, would you rather, if you're storing your money in, in the place where you can trust that it can be better or you can verify that it can be better? Well, let's say you had a secret that you told your friend. Would you rather trust that they would not tell you or could you, would you rather have verifiable proof? that they wouldn't tell anybody. You'd rather have verifiable proof. It's it's obvious. And that's why Bitcoin works. It's why it has worked. And it will continue to work because it's proof of work. Yeah. Verifiable proof of work. Yeah. I say it's walk, not talk, right? Yeah, so true. Yeah. And so what you went on this research, you went down your own rabbit hole. What's the biggest insight that you got out of that? Like, what's the biggest thing you learned? Yeah, really understanding what money is was the was the turning point for me in the true orange pill moment and that came from reading safe Dean's book the Bitcoin standard and I didn't even have to get to the to the Bitcoin part of that book to understand how brilliant Bitcoin was because money 
really is just a transfer of value over space scales and time used as a medium of exchange by the market. And the monetary good that transfers value most effectively over space scales and time is the one that's going to win. Yeah. The hardest money is the one that's going to win. And Bitcoin is the monetary good that transfers value the best over space scales and time. And it is the hardest money in the universe. So I, I knew all of those things. I knew that Bitcoin was uh, fixed in its supply, 21 million Bitcoins. I knew that it was digital. So it pretty much solved the space and scales part. And once I learned really what, what money is, I was like, okay, Bitcoin checks all the boxes and, and it really does. And, and once you understand that question, I think that's the foundation of everything is money in this world for better or for worse. It, it's the thread running through everything. If you look all around you, money is connected to this photo frame over here. It's connected to this wall that's built over here. It's connected to this computer that's connected to the internet here. Everything is connected to money. And so when you understand what money is and you understand the implications of that answer to the question, then you understand the foundation of the world. And then from there, you can build your understanding. And that's why I think Bitcoin is really the ultimate endless rabbit hole because it is money and learning about what money is, is an endless discovery of new learnings, an endless exploration and discovery of new learnings. And that's why it also has such a great impact because it's connected to everything and because broken money right now is connected to everything. So it breaks everything above it. And so when we fix that foundation of the world, money with Bitcoin, everything else on top of it gets fixed as well. Yeah. Yeah. It won't surprise you, but I fully agree. <laughs> I would add to that once you, because you said, you know, once you understand that money is in everything you see, mm -hmm. I once saw a podcast by um, it's a guy called Nate Hagens, and he was a uh, guest on Aubrey Marcus. You know, Aubrey Marcus podcast? Yes, yeah, sure it is. This guy is called Nate Hagens. He's like an energy expert. This was not a Bitcoin related talk, but they, they talked about energy. And Nate said, look around you, everything you see costs energy to create or maintain. And then, uh, so I heard that. And then I heard, I think Sailor probably talk about, you know, money is energy. It's just um, a way of communicating value with each other. And then I thought, yeah, that's it. That's when it connected for me. So mm. yes, money touches everything, but actually energy touches everything, right? I have finite energy in time that I can spend on something for you, right? And that's my proposition. Yeah. And we agree how many units of a currency that um, should be rewarded with, right? That's what we agree. And then when we do the transaction, we communicate with each other, yes. right? And once I saw that energy part, and also, by the way, connected that with the, with the proof of work, right? The mining, the creation of new currency units where real energy is expended to create something a, a digital coin or asset mm -hmm. that is actually energy captured in a, digi a digital way, mm -hmm. then it made so much sense for me that this should be money because uh, the money that we currently use, right? The fiat money is created without anything. It's, yeah. it's nothing, right? It's, it's digital, but it's with the press of a button, but it's just a number in a database. No, no, no work went in to, to create that. And, Kind of just like that, only that mental model, um, for me, I think was also a big accelerator in, yeah. uh, in seeing it. Yeah. Our money today breaks the laws of physics. And if there is any absolute that is true, it's that everything is energy. These words that I'm speaking right now carry a certain amount of energy. I hate yes. you and I love you have a different amount of energy. Everything is energy. And so when you break the laws of physics and one of the laws of physics in the universe is energy cannot be created or destroyed. We're all just harnessing energy that's already there in yeah. more effective ways. And so when you can create $6 trillion of coronavirus stimulus by just typing in a few numbers into a computer and sending those to other people's bank accounts, you are literally creating energy because money, money is economic energy. Yes. 
Yes. And this is the problem, right? This is yes. the problem. Yes. And that so, is the fundamental yeah. problem. Yes. yes. That you can create money out of thin air. You are creating yeah. energy because when you have $6 trillion, that has a certain amount of economic energy, right? You can go out and buy a certain number of houses, yes. Ferraris, goods and services, and all of those things have energy as well. And so you're, you're literally breaking the laws of the universe with fiat money. Whereas Bitcoin, as you touched on, you, it's required to dedicate energy to create and mine new Bitcoins. If there was no energy dedicated to the network, there would be no Bitcoins mined. And that's a great yeah. thing. We're returning money and the foundation of our world back to the laws of physics and the universe. I mean, it's similar with gold, right? Like ev eventually the creation of gold is the compression of energy in the earth somewhere, right? To, to create so. this shiny rock, right? Spot um, on. I, I think there's way more history about uh, the choice for gold, actually, which is uh, fairly interesting. For example, uh, gold is the only uh, like shiny rock that has a different type of color than all the other mm -hmm. ones are grayish, right? I once read this article about why uh, gold was chosen. Um, anyway, but I, to stay with the point of energy, right? Mm -hmm. If you defy the laws of physics, and you just create energy out of nothing. That is when you also corrupt the incentives of the people using the tool money to exchange value with each other, right? And yeah, yeah I wanted to ask you what, what is the biggest thing people need to understand about the financial system, right? But I, in my opinion, this is kind of it, right? You are trading yeah. your finite time and energy for something, for a reward that can be created infinitely. And that is just very, that's not smart, right? That's Hor horrendously stupid <laughs> yeah. It, because you're dedicating your time and your energy to provide value to the market in some way, whether you own your own business or you provide yes. whatever, your hours whatever to way. an yeah. employer, you want to save the value that you receive yes. in something that stores that energy properly over time. And so when you have a leaky source of energy an inflationary monetary system that you're storing your money in, well, then your energy is leaking out such that if you, if you worked, you know, 40 hours in a week and, and yeah, you, uh, you lost half of your money, money's value just because of inflation, it would be like you worked 20 hours, but you actually worked 40. And so when you store your money in an inflationary system, your, your time is getting stolen. And that's, I don't know why anyone would want that, or you can take the inverse and store your money and a fixed supply asset protected by the largest computer network in the world that's that runs on verifiable proof of work such that you actually gain back your time yes. over time and that's that's just an obvious choice for me yes for me too but i think i think two things i think there's a nice leeway into the topic of risk that i wanted to talk about but i think the first thing is you know when you say your time is stolen or your energy is stolen right i, mm -hmm. I talked about this with jeff booth who says you know taxation is theft inflation is theft and i asked him you know i these words already i think this is kind of in in the first three steps of someone's bitcoin journey right you hear this and you think oh that's pretty harsh and then you could be like oh, that's interesting why would someone say that right or the other the other type of person is like no, but the government's not stealing my time or energy or the banks are not doing that, right? Like it's, it's this, um, kind of like cognitive dissonance, I would say, right? Like, do, does it trigger me to be curious or not? And I think if it doesn't trigger you, then, then you will have a very hard time to eventually <laughs> end up with, with Bitcoin. Um, but, but this is so essential, you know, why, why, why would, why would you trade your finite time and energy for something that can, be created infinitely it is it, it's so exactly. illogical it, it's just not smart but i think you know you you just mentioned school in the beginning this uh and and you well, i assume also grew up in a in a in a western country and i, I talked about this a lot yeah. already but you know we never questioned money what is money you know i have a son i give him some coins he goes to the store he gets a thing and i'm just thinking like what am i actually doing you know uh <laughs> but i'm i'm still following what was programmed in me you know mm -hmm. and um it's just very interesting that if someone says you know the money you use uh, actually steals your time right 
Yeah, it, it, it sounds so nonsensical. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like what? That can't possibly be true. But let, like, let's actually understand it. So if you, we'll go back to the same example, but just flesh it out a, a little bit further. You dedicated forty hours in a week, and you earned a hundred dollars total for those forty hours. Okay, if if that monetary system that you store your money, let's say you store your money in U.S. dollars, you're a hundred dollars. If that inflation rate for that money is 5%, you will lose half of your value in 14 years. The rule of 72. So then that $100 in 14 years at a 5% inflation rate becomes worth $50, right? You still have your $100, but because 5% more dollars have increased in, in the total monetary supply, you've been debased. 50% after 14 years. So now that $100 is worth $50, and at that same rate, which would be about $2.5 an hour when you work 40 hours, that gets cut in half. It's only now 1.25. You've worked 20 hours, or at that same rate, it's, it's still 2.5, right? But you've only worked 20 hours to receive that $50. And so you've had your time is stolen from you because you actually did work 40 hours, but yes. because it's been inflated away to where it's only worth $50 now, it's saying that you only worked 20 hours. So yeah. you had 20 hours stolen from you out of thin air because you stored your money in an inflationary monetary system. Yeah. And this is also why people spend a lot of the money in the short term, right? And this exactly. is, I think, a second order eff effect eventually, you know? Mm -hmm. That's that's if time I, preference. Yeah. Yes, but I think it's 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 not all conscious. I don't think people think, you know, oh my money is melting away, so I'm gonna spend it today. In I don't know what the mechanic behind is it is actually. I don't know why people are doing it, but in some way people know that saving, although I would assume you're a bit younger than me, but I grew up with, you know, saving is is the thing, you know? Mm-hmm. You cannot save. If you save for 14 years because you want to move and buy a house, then your purchase, purchasing power will be halved, yeah. right? So the entire effort of saving was futile. And I, I don't think, again, necessarily people look at it towards the future, but in some way they know that it's not attainable. I don't know, right? And that's why they have a high time preference they yes are spending stuff now right and that's also why we are in a consuming society consumerism society instead of a builder society right I, exactly uh, i love the tweet i saw last week like if you if you if you think about like all these old buildings that are still here right like buildings mm -hmm. of 200 300 years old like cathedrals that took 80 years to build or something a lifetime yeah. a lifetime to build right yeah to survive three, four, five lifetimes. That is incomprehensible, I think. Yeah. In some the people, current times. Some people, you know, again, same time frame, 200, 300 years ago, would spend their entire life working on a building. They would die yes. and the building would not be complete. Yes. That just does not exist today because of time preference. And it is a very subconscious thing. Like, for example, I used to play poker a bunch and Poker and really gambling in general is a high time preference decision. It's highly speculative. And so you go and you gamble and you try to win money quickly, very, very quickly. I've been largely disincentivized from going and gambling, even though I still love the game of poker and I still play every once in a while. I play at a much lower rate because I know that the money that I dedicate to going and gambling can instead be saved in Bitcoin which will appreciate over time. And so I'm making that economic decision. Do I want to go risk this money now to go essentially get rich quick, or I can save for the long run assuredly and have my value go up and have more money to spend down the line. And so I now play poker and I, I really don't like to gamble much at all because I know I can just spend and really save that money in Bitcoin instead. And that's a, been like a subconscious thing. I haven't made that decision. Oh no, I'm just going to 
saving Bitcoin now instead of going to gamble. It's just like kind of leaked into my way of yeah. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, same. Uh, I, I, I've repeatedly shared the example of sneakers. For example, if I see a pair of sneakers where I'm like, oh, the, those are nice sneakers. And I think <laughs> like, no, I don't need sneakers. And then I just yeah. buy $200 of Bitcoin, for example. Um, but yeah, that, that just creeps in. And it's funny, right? Because it, it sounds risky. It sounds risky to be like, okay, I'm going to put this into something that's going to accrue over time. And then whenever I want it, you know, on my four or five year time horizon, maybe 10 year time horizon, mm -hmm. then I can do something with it. I can build something with it or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, right. Prepare to have a family or, you know, whatever. And I think that is one of the things that are also, I think interesting in personal journeys where you're, you're like the gratification is further away. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if that's for you also the part of sleeping well, but for me, it definitely <laughs> is because I, I just know, like I'm not, yeah. I, uh, when I discovered Bitcoin, like 2013, I also used to do day trading or like, I think I did that for like three, four months or something mm -hmm. daily daily and it was crazy volatile right and i remember one evening i was just laying in bed and i was just hallucinating i like i, I was awake but i saw like the charts like flying in my room and i was just thinking like oh my position this isn't that and then i just quit and it's funny and now i have to think of this because we were talking about it but I, now since i'm just saving in bitcoin yeah i have great sleep you know yeah uh, i do check the price in the, in the morning <laughs> right yeah but it's, it's, it's different. It gives you, I don't know, more of life in some way. Yes. Like, certainly you don't have to, like, I know in the long run, Bitcoin is going up in value. You know, my purchasing power will increase because everything else is going up in supply. Bitcoin is capped at 21 million. And so I can save there and confidently say in five years from now, my Bitcoin will allow me to have more purchasing power. And so there's actually an incentive there that's built into the market and producers because for me to give up my Bitcoin and go spend it, I have to be buying something that I perceive to be highly valuable. And so by moving into this new monetary world where we know that we can save for the long term and appreciate our purchasing power, it signals to producers, well, you better produce something highly valuable yes. to receive Bitcoin. And so that's a massive benefit for all consumers because only more and more valuable things are going to be brought to the market because only valuable things are going to succeed in the market because we know the money is gaining value over time and I can buy more of things later if I don't spend it now, whereas it's the exact opposite today. Yes. The money is going to be worth less. So I'm actually incentivized to spend it now yeah. on something. And as a creator, and a builder, I'm incentivized to not give exactly the best so value right it it you're incentivized to just it's it's completely flipped on its head and that's yeah versus you know you're you're essentially trying to bring something that's not valuable just to receive money as quickly as possible you want the lowest price good that whatever it is and that's why we have mm -hmm. all these low quality manufactured goods and i swear that the quality of pieces of furniture and desks and and everything really in our life is just degraded because we have a money that's worth less over time and it incentivizes not bringing highly valuable goods yeah. because we don't, we're not too concerned about what we buy with our money because it's going, it's going to be worth less anyway. So we'll just spend as low as we can now. And that's the decision that's made. I love how in the short time frame, I think we already touched like five, five intertwined topics <laughs> around Bitcoin, but that is also. Yesterday I also had a discussion on Twitter or it was this morning. I don't know the finance guy on Twitter, you know him, mm, I don't know, that yeah. he's, he's so anti Bitcoin and, but it's so the finance guy, it's disingenuous in a sense. I also asked him like, uh, I said, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what he said, but I said, I, I think you should study more. I think as a finance person, I said, it's this, by the way, to everyone, any finance person, any techno uh, technology person. Right. If you are not studying Bitcoin, what are you doing? You know, this is the biggest discovery in your field. 
And if you're intellectually honest, you should study, you know, exactly. and, and, it, and it's really hard because it, you know, I mean, we're talking for 30 minutes <laughs> and I don't know, I visualized this Venn diagram that we went like all over the place. <laughs> um, and so I said that to him and he's like, yeah, oh, that's such a stupid argument. Everyone says I should study more of this and that. But it is, it is hard to understand because you never thought about this, right? So you can, you can think that you know a lot about finance and stocks and investing and all that stuff. But if you don't even, uh, if you haven't researched what money is, exactly, then, you know, what are you, what are you doing? You know, um, Yeah. uh, yeah, I, I honestly think that. And I think once you understand that, you know, if we have a free value exchange, right? I have a value proposition. You say, I will pay you a thousand units of a dollar. We shake hands. You know, we are super free in yeah. doing that, right? That's totally free market. But once you realize that there's a third party who influences the reward that you are giving me. Well, yeah, if you're intellectually honest, you're going to start asking <laughs> questions like, okay, how does that, how does that work? Right. You know? Uh, and then you get to, you know, if you put your money in a bank, is it actually yours? No, it's not, it's not yours. You're lending it out to the bank. Okay. Then what are stocks? Are you actually the owner of a stock? Is it your property? No, right. There's only ownership on paper, you know, in your Robin Hood app, it, it'll show your yeah. name. Even it's not, house. it's not your property. Yeah. You don't even own your house. Oh, house. No. I saw a video of a guy who bought a home in, um, in uh, California somewhere in like the seventies for like, he said like $80,000 or something like yeah. big, big house, right? California, lots of land and his property tax per year was something like $20,000 or something. And the guy was like 73 and he was like, I'm working to pay for the property taxes. <laughs> and when I saw that, I was like, okay. So even when you paid off your home and it accrued in value, outside of your influence in a, in a massive way, Mm -hmm. right? And you still have to pay your property tax. And one, if you don't pay, if you don't make it, then the government can still take your home away. Exactly. Is that ever going to happen? Well, probably happened to some people, right? But the, 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 it's more about the concept of the fact that it's possible. You have to accept that it's possible. And then if you are, presented a solution or an asset mm-hmm. or a money or a technology, however you want to call Bitcoin, that totally defies that problem. Yeah, you should pay attention. I mean, yeah. That, uh, yeah, I don't know. Logically, it's like, if you think about the housing thing, it's like if, you, if you're renting a home from somebody, right, and you don't pay rent, they have the right to kick you out. Okay, you're the renter, you don't own the home. You're essentially renting your property that you quote unquote own from the government because you're paying property tax to basically have the right to own the house. But if you don't pay the property tax, the government who actually owns a home will come and kick you out and say, nope, you don't have it anymore. So you don't actually own your house. Straight up, you're, you're renting it from the government and you're paying it off via property tax. And so Bitcoin's also highly significant because it's the, maybe the first ever property that you can actually own for yourself. And nobody can come take it from you. There's no property tax that you pay and it's permissionless, right? I don't have to go get permission from a bank account to get access to the monetary ledger of Bitcoin. And it, and it, it just changes everything. And even going back to your bank's point, like does the finance guy understand that when I go or he goes and deposits money at his bank, the bank is required to keep 0% of his dollars yes, exactly. in their reserves? Does he understand that? Because if he did, wouldn't he be like, what the heck am I doing? Yes, here? exactly. Well, that's what I would expect too. You know, once you Logically, understand that, that you know, I don't know. Apparently you, not. <laughs> you'd like to think the finance guy would, would understand that. But what is money is the defining question of our time in human history. Yes. And those that understand it are going to be uh, more advantageously positioned for the future that's coming. And those that don't, they won't be. Yeah. Everyone who gets Bitcoin at the price they deserve. My question about risk was, I wanted to ask you how you define risk, but I think we touched upon it a bit. And I like the example of, you know, you, as you said, you go out, you have a job or you have a venture, which is already taking risk, right? And 
your, your, because of your choice, right? To work for a certain company or be active in a certain market, right? Mm -hmm. You spend your time and energy on something that you think will give you a reward that's, that has X amount of risk to it. Yeah. Nothing is zero risk. But because your reward is influenced by a third party that devalues it over time, when you come home, if you don't do anything, then in 14 years, you will have half of your purchasing power, left, <laughs> right? So yeah. that is a risk, you know, believing that that will be different <laughs> is a risk. So when you, when you get home, you have to take more risk. Yes. You have to try to mitigate that uh, debasement of the reward that you just got. And that is why so many people, you know, and I think your, your story is uh, an example of that, right? They think, okay, I need to go into the stock market. I need to invest, right? I need to get in yeah. crypto. I need to, you know, so you feel you have to do something, but because you don't really understand why you end up at the wrong solution, quote unquote, I'd say, right? right? So instead of you skipped past the whole saving part <laughs> without understanding why, and then you immediately go into the investing part. And yeah, I just want to ask you, how, how do you see that, that risk part? But also, do you think Bitcoin is risky or how do you explain to yourself why Bitcoin is the lowest risk thing that you can own? Yeah, big questions. I would say, I'll start out by saying the riskiest allocation to Bitcoin is 0%. And really how I think of risk is, can it be taken from me? Can it be inflated away and thus my value and purchasing power debased? What are the chances that it collapses and, and fails? You know, Kodak used to be the biggest uh, camera company in the world and now it's, it doesn't exist anymore. So if I stored my money in there, well, no company has been around forever. And so there's risk there. And then why is Bitcoin the least riskiest well because again it, it's not controlled by a, a single issuer like a like a, an ethereum right if i if i store my money in ethereum well there's these foundation heads that can make the decision without me uh, approving of it to move from proof of work to proof of stake and so they've shifted the entire underworkings of where i've stored my money because they've said so and so now we're right back at the same thing where I store my money in the US dollar or any other fiat currency with a central bank and the government behind it. Well, the central bank has the right to say, well, we're printing a, a poop ton of money today. And thus my value is going to be debased. And so when I store my money in Bitcoin, there's nobody at that central top position that can arbitrarily debase and steal my value from me. So that's one thing. Second is how is the network can basically how is the network protected what's the moat around the system well if you're talking about apple well they have a large moat because they have network effects right the iphone is highly popular around the world it's tough for someone to infiltrate into that market and take away from the iphone because there's societal standards and stigmas and people like having the iphone and etc cetera, etc cetera. but is apple going to be around forever Likely not, because they're a company. So when I think of, well, what's the mode around Bitcoin? It's, it's that computer power. It's computing power is really what it is. And I want to get these numbers right, but I believe in 2013, the computing power of the Bitcoin network, and it was only four years into Bitcoin's lifespan, was 256 times more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers in the world combined. This is four years into its lifespan. And so there was about 4.66 petahashes of computing power dedicated to the network that made that so. And so this year, we've seen 650 exahashes of computing power. And there's a thousand exahashes of, there's a thousand petahashes in an exahash. And so that's 650,000 uh, petahashes. And so the computing power of the Bitcoin network, right? 650,000 divided by 4.66 is about 140,000. So the computing power of the Bitcoin network, which is what protects the network, which 
is what protects someone from coming in and 51% attacking, double spending, taking over the time chain, whatever it is. That computing power has increased by 140,000 times in 11 years from the point in 2013 where it was already 256 times more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers in the world. And so I'm like, okay, there's something that, where I can store my money, where I can actually own it. I can actually own the keys from it. There's no property tax. There's no maintenance. There's no insurance I have to pay. That can't be manipulated and debased by a central authority. That's protected. And that's also permissionless, right? I don't have to go to a bank and give them my ID and say, hey, I want to sign up for your banking system. I don't have to do that with Bitcoin. It's peer to peer. And it's protected by the most powerful computing network in the world, exponentially so over everything else. And that, that computing power that's being dedicated, the hash rate that's being demonstrated by the Bitcoin network is only exponentially increasing as people increasingly understand all of those realities. And so when I think, again, Bitcoin's the least speculative asset in, in the planet, it's also the least riskiest. That's not to say it has zero risk. There are threats to planet Earth and other things as well. But <laughs> like, yeah. that, if that's what it's going to take to bring down my monetary value, I'm cool with that. Okay, we have yeah. bigger problems. I have bigger problems to worry about. So that's well, the, the, the Bitcoin. Been in multiple discussions where people are like, yeah, but what if we get nuked? Or what if uh, the all, all the governments in the world will shut down the internet at the same time, you know, and then... <laughs> Sure. My my general sure. reply now is, okay, if you ended up at this argument or reasoning, I've, I think I've made my point. <laughs> you yeah, know? like you're I, taking it to the ultimate extreme. Yeah, the, the, the if a meteor extreme. hits, then what? Yeah, you <laughs> you have a different problem. Then you're Still, dead. <laughs> if there's two, if there's two uh, satellites, blockstream satellites, you know, with their node, Bitcoin exactly. still survives, right? Exactly. And you know, it's so funny. I'm thinking about how I think Bitcoiners are really annoying, uh, <laughs> especially people who, who, who really did the work. It's like, there's an answer to everything. And that's why it also sounds too good to be true mm. for some yeah. people. Um, you know, I think Bitcoin still needs to be maintained, developed, improved, all yes. these, all these things, you know, yes, especially not, um, distorted. This uh, ordin ordinal stuff. Well, it's a yeah. di di different, <laughs> different subject, but um, it is very, very solid. It's very solid, yeah. right? And I think that also in terms of, of of risk, that people should understand that also fiat money, the fiat money system, is is a big experiment. And in in the entire history of time, the you know fifty years in uh, in America with fiat money. Yeah. Um, like, look at the data, right? Look at the mm -hmm. data. You stored your money in fiat for the last 53 years. What has happened? Your purchasing power has gone down. Incredibly so. You no, stored it was your a money big party first. <laughs> you, right? You the stored 80s your... and 90s were a big party. <laughs> True, yeah. But it's, it's like over time, let, let's see what the market is telling us because the market yeah. is the sum total of of market intelligence worldwide versus one person. So don't listen to me, listen to the market. The market's told you that if you stored your money in the US dollar, which is the best fiat currency out of all of them, you've lost your money at about 7% a year since 1971. Okay, well, if I've stored my money in Bitcoin since 2009, what's happened? Even in 2010, it's outperformed literally everything else in the universe. So when you're faced with a decision of where should I store my money, start there and then ask, well, why is fiat going down in value at 7% a year? Yeah. Why is Bitcoin going up in, at 63% a year? Compound annual growth rate. So like what, what's going on here? Why is that so? And so then you get into the question and then it trickles down to like, what is inflation? And then you know, what is... Uh, decentralization versus centralization and you ultimately trickle down and what is money so just start there like what is money 
figure it out from there. And then you'll realize the answer to both of those questions. And you'll realize that Bitcoin is the best money in the universe. And that's why it is the best performing asset in the yes. universe since it was created. Exactly. A finance guy also said in the, in the thread of tweets, uh, because someone else said, well, uh, what uh, over the past 15 years, what has outperformed? And then he said, yeah, Bitcoin, but once it doesn't, you will hear from me. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's just, well, sorry, <laughs> it's just really funny. But, but wait, what I wanted to say is you're, sh you're sharing this and I'm just thinking we can go really high with Bitcoin. I mean, the meme of, you know, uh, Bitcoin is an infinite price, you know, from, from the Simpsons. It's, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, <laughs> that's not going to happen, right? But if we are here already and this thing keeps growing and we are only 15 years yeah. into this, and I think this is a fun question, but I don't think more than a million people understand what Bitcoin really is. Mm -hmm. I wonder what your number is. You can think about it, but let's say, you know, it's, 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 it's not more than a hundred million people who own Bitcoin. Yeah. Definitely. And we are here yeah. already, right? Yeah. There, th these people have figured Bitcoin out in, in to some degree, you know, um, yeah. and we are here already. Like this can go really, really, really far. Uh, I'll yes. let you answer the number, uh, <laughs> question. And then, uh, I have the yeah. apex predator of wealth question. Sure. Yeah. Nice. I think the number, how many people truly understand Bitcoin? Uh, it's probably one to five million, somewhere in that range. But like to me, understanding Bitcoin, you know, nobody fully understands Bitcoin. Let's let's no, but be as to what we that. just talked about, right? Right. Yeah. Problem like those, solution. Like, yeah. Yes. Like, what is money? And then, really, to me, if you're fully convicted about Bitcoin, you're like. I'm saving my money in Bitcoin. There's not even a doubt about it. Yeah. And so once you get to that level and you fully understand why you're not concerned and you're actually cheering for lower prices because you can acquire the apex predator of wealth storage at a lower exchange rate. Once you get to all of those points, okay, I think you probably quote unquote understand Bitcoin. And there's probably one to one to five million people, but I think talking about touching on the point of how early we are to Bitcoin, let's understand how early we are to humanity. The entire yeah. world wasn't even <laughs> mapped out by the, the civilized world 450 years ago. Like we didn't have everything discovered back then. There were humans there, but we didn't really have it mapped out. Mm. And we're, so we've just discovered the, the actual fullness of earth, you know, only a matter of a hundred years ago or, or hundreds of years ago. And so when we talk about how early we are to Bitcoin, it's like, how early are we to humanity and our lifespan? You know, there's this video on YouTube that goes through the, basically the entire course of earth and all of the different periods and uh, ice ages and, and dinosaurs. And it shows like, you know, what's going on on earth at that time. And it, and it plays a long YouTube video. So dinosaurs have like, Two and a half minutes of the video. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe even longer. Is this the hour and, one? Like if yes. uh, if if yes. uh, if uh, life on Earth is an hour or something like that. Something something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And then yeah. and then humanity is like not even a second. It's literally not. Even no, a it's second. like half a second or a few yeah. milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I so know, you're like, yeah. what? <laughs> just understand how early we are to humanity, mm. and we're just figuring out money now. So think about all the things that can take place as a result of this monetary innovation, yes. really us figuring out money for the first time yeah. and how early we are. Yes. To Bitcoin. And, you know, only one to 5 million people understand it, less than a hundred million people own it, but how early we are to humanity we we are in our infancy as a species. I love that. I, in general, this really helped me to zoom out in different ways to also mm -hmm. I think few certain things that were given to me that, that were programmed in me or, 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 or taught to me, right. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you zoom out a bit more then a lot of stuff is loose sand basically. Right. 
um, you know, also in terms of history or whatever, like we weren't, we weren't there. So it's, it's, it's in, in some cases, I think it's guessing. Um, but that is also the interesting part, right? Like we cannot be rigid, uh, about that. We have to stay curious and what you said triggered me to think like the, I do think that like the fiat money has our thinking in a certain place that is not beneficial for us, right? Like no. the high time preference of, uh, you know, it already exists 15 years. Bitcoin should be a thing, right? Or, you know, whatever. That's one example, right? But the other, mm -hmm. like the instant gratification, we want clarity now, right? Uh, yes. I think less curiosity overall. Um, Yes. And I mean, more also, let, let's say like, I'm, I'm, for example, very interested in like past and ancient civilizations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like if it's if, also less time to spend on things that interest us because our time is being stolen. That's very true. Yeah. And so that leaks into everything else. Yeah. That's why we have to be a high time. Practice. I love this, right? We can go any, 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 yeah. uh, any, any, uh, any direction. Also, this also why. I think it's sometimes annoying to talk to me if I talk with my friends. Like everything, I can relate everything back to, bit, to Bitcoin. Yes, because money is connected <laughs> to everything. Yes, that's, exactly. That's, yes, yes, yes. Well, it know. creates your incentives without you knowing it. Yes, right. Exactly. And I think what you're saying is great. Like um, you, you, you have less time to, yeah, like be curious and yeah. and figure out stuff and just go down a random rabbit hole to see if something is interesting, right? Um, I think it already starts by the way with wh what do you want to study? What do you want to become? Yeah. Stuff like, stuff like that. Right. What do you truly want? And then how can you dedicate yeah. your time and energy to fulfilling that? Well, I think eventually a lot of people, no, not a lot of people. I think in the, in the, in the people I know who really found what they enjoy, they do the same as when they were like, 14, Kids. 15. Yes. Yeah. So sure. Yeah. Um, that, that, yeah. That's, that's like our nature. It's like, for me, you know, I love writing now and I've, I've really started to step into that a lot in the past year. And when I think about the third grade, I also loved writing mm. you know, and I love playing sports, but and I still play sports today, but it's just different. It's like the things that you love, you've always loved. And yes. So that's, that's a great, that's a high signal perspective to take on like, what do you truly want? What do you truly enjoy? What are you truly passionate about? What are you truly curious about? Think about all of those things when you're a kid and what your kid version answered those questions with. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. So you are building Gator Capital and yes, on the website, it says generating positive returns in BTC terms is the only performance metric that matters because BTC is the only denominator that matters. And I wanted to explore it a little bit, but I think we actually talked about it. Uh, everything around that, we talked about it, you know, but eventually once you see Bitcoin as the denominator of value of everything, right? Because it's mm -hmm. digital energy, because it will not be uh, diluted in supply, you know, it won't lose its value, the not value in USD sense, right? But yeah, there will not be any more, right? The monetary policy will be, will be followed. Once you see that this is the, probably one of, or maybe the only engineered constant, right? Or engineered truth in that is not, that does not come from nature. Right. So that's why I say engineered. Yeah. I think I'm thinking about how to say it, but you know what I mean, right? Like I it's do. not, it's not an, a constant from nature. It's an engineered constant basically mm -hmm. that influences our lives because we can use it to communicate value with each other. Mm -hmm. Once you see that, then yeah, anything denominated in Bitcoin will get cheaper because yes. I don't know if you saw this picture. I love the picture of like the, there's like this green, green pyramid, mm -hmm. which is like the, uh, or an orange pyramid, sorry, which is like Bitcoin. And then there's an upside down, really big pyramid. So the points are touching each other. The apexes are touching each other. Mm -hmm. And the orange pyramid represents Bitcoin and that pyramid will not grow. Right. 
because it's 21 million units that make up that, that pyramid. So yeah. every, all the energy is condensed in that little pyramid. And the green pyramid on top, it basically points down is all the productivity, oh, all the value in the world, right? And that will just slowly siphon into the small pyramid, but the small pyramid yes. will not get bigger. And I think we will also get to the question in that sense. I think that's a good leeway to the elasticity uh, <laughs> argument, right? Each of the blocks, each of the 21 million blocks will capture more value in their block. Yes. I think that's how you should see it. I don't know. Maybe you can explain, but that, uh, yeah. I, if, I find that an interesting topic. I have seen that graphic that you're talking about. It's that big green and then it's yes. that small yeah, little. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's basically describing Bitcoin as a black hole. Yes. And it, and it is. And so what's happening, let's say, you know, there's that 21 million and there's, there's, you know, X amounts that say there's a hundred amounts of productivity valued in that 21 million. Well, if new productivity units come in and that unit is doubled, well, that's still being priced in that same 21 million. Yes. And so then money has to be taken out of that existing amount of productivity to, to be assigned to that new productivity. And so what happens is that existing productivity goes down in price to allocate the value to that new productivity. And that results in lower prices in that finite system. And that's why everything trends towards zero against Bitcoin Yeah, over time. Yeah, because you price it in the unit, right? Yes. So 21 million units that you can use to price stuff in. And if you visualize each unit, I always think about like a 3D cube, right? And there's mm -hmm. all this productivity. I think that's the best word to use, right? So yes, the value that we ascribe to the productivity comes after the productivity, right? So I offer my productivity to you and you, that's my value proposition, right? Yes. I'm productive and I'm producing this value. I want a thousand units. You say 800. We, I say, okay, that's, that's our free market value exchange. Mm -hmm. And the value is the product of my productivity, but the, uh, the currency unit rewards my productivity. The value is, is one part of the exchange and the reward is the other, right? But, um, and so when we have these 21 million cubes and just more and more productivity and energy from productivity gets into this, this cube, it's basically diluting. I don't want to say diluting. I think we have to think about the, the, the best word, but it's repricing that value in terms of the denominator Bitcoin, the, mm -hmm. the cube. Does that make sense? So if we yes. have one cube, you say 100 units of productivity get in there, right? But once it becomes a thousand, the cube doesn't get bigger. It's still one one Bitcoin, right? Exactly. So then it's one divided by 1000 versus one divided by 100 before. And that is why, yeah, you said black hole of value, right? I think that's, um, or the apex predator of of value storage, wealth storage, whatever you yeah. want to call it, because as we alluded to before, everything around you costs energy to create or maintain. So the wealth, the reward, uh, you know, the monetary energy that you gather, which is your wealth comes from mm -hmm. productivity. Eventually that is all connected. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it all gets sucked in these 21 million units, yeah. then the price of the 21 million units in any other denominator will go up forever. Yes. And so it's like, and I'll kind of say the same thing, but this is how I was just visualizing it. So if you have that pyramid of that 21 million fixed supply of Bitcoin and all of the productivity in the world is in that pyramid and it can never be changed. All right. So let's say there was a hundred units of productivity in that 21 million builds the entire pyramid all the way to the top. So as new productivity comes onto the market, it has to go into that 21 million. And so yes. that existing productivity has to make room for that new productivity. So the value of that productivity has to go down. The price of it has of to go down. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So it can fit into the pyramid. And that's a continually perpetuating system until all that value, existing value goes down as more and more and more value comes in. And so every yep. prices are just continually trendy down over time against Bitcoin, falling to the 
marginal cost of production, which over time is potentially zero. Yeah. Per, and if we then tie that everything. to what you said before, you know, if you then eventually want to earn Bitcoin for the value you provide, you actually have to provide enough quote unquote value for people to part way with exactly. Bitcoin as your reward. And, and then there will be people that say like, yeah, but that's not fair because then not everyone, you know, can have a business, I don't know, make cookies or, or cakes or <laughs> whatever. Um, but I think that's the entire point. I think that's twofold. One, that is the real world, right? Yes, uh, in my, exactly. from my understanding of capitalism, that would that's be nature. That would be pure capitalism. I'm better at making cakes than you are. So I win, you lose. But to add to that, I don't think that is um, a bad thing for you because mm -hmm. the the you know the productivity is condensed and condensed and condensed. You also don't need a lot of reward to live a life because everything is cheaper, right? Exactly. So if you try if you try one thing exactly. and you fail. It's not bad. Like in the current world, it's in the current money system, it, it is somewhat bad, right? Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, it would be, or, or from the understanding I have, it would be less bad. You can actually try more yes. things. You can actually exactly. figure out what am I here to do? What, how can I actually add value? Exactly. As abundance increases, and we're actually pricing that abundance in properly, everything's getting cheaper over time. And so that allows us, well, I don't even, it will get to a point eventually where you won't even have to provide value to, to sustain yourself to some degree because yes. everything will be so affordable. The, the value that you have to provide will be so minimal that you can go out and explore your creative curiosities. Build a cathedral or a, what, yeah, a Mount Rushmore exactly. or whatever. Like the most beautiful thing you can ever imagine. You can spend all your time doing that and not necessarily be making money from it. But because everything else is so abundant and affordable, you can go out and do that. You can go out the Swiss Alps, spend weeks reading books on top of the mountain and not have to be concerned about paying bills because everything is going down in price and becoming so affordable. You can make crappy cakes and sell them to the market and not succeed and still live your life uh, without a sweat because everything is so affordable. And so when you actually price in the productivity of humanity properly, abundance just explodes towards infinity. Yeah. And everyone benefits as a result. We will, we will, we will get deeper into this, but I'm thinking now, okay, if you have more space to try stuff, mm -hmm. then you will have more space to fill. Then you will have more space to learn. And then if everyone learns from their mistakes and then consequently finds what they're actually good at then people will not only be happier things will be more beautiful food will be more tasty all these things exactly and that's that's why money that's why it's fixed the money fix the world yeah and affordable health care like everything just everything gets fixed when you fix the thing yeah that because people are enjoying the what they do Right. So even if you, if now, if you go to a restaurant, is the chef, does the chef really want to be a chef? You know, yeah, is this right. the best yeah. food that that chef can make? Right. Or is this the best doctor you can have or the best carpenter or whatever? Yes. And so now when you get, when you get to that point where people are putting more of their energy, like true heartfelt energy into these things, you get better products as a result. Yes. yes. Because the, the chef isn't working about, well, I just need to go get hired somewhere. And I don't even want to cook this food, but I'm here. Well, there's a certain amount of heartfelt energy when the person that's eating the food is eating the food versus yeah. someone that truly loves cooking, loves what they do, isn't concerned about necessarily making money from it. It's also felt in the food. And I'd rather eat food from the latter chef than the former. And that's the world that we're stepping into. Yeah. That's the world that I would live in. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about, uh, as I, 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 um, I mentioned Gator Capital. Um, yeah. What are you building? Yeah. So the one liners were building the Bitcoin Berkshire. And so to touch on your previous comment about generating returns in 
generating positive returns in Bitcoin terms is the only metric that matters because Bitcoin is the only denominator that matters. Well, that's the, the issue that the current and future investment world is facing is, well, if I can hold Bitcoin and outperform your other investment, I'm just going to hold Bitcoin. The only reason I will part with my Bitcoin is to own some sort of operational asset, something that's giving me more Bitcoin over time. And what also changes and what people often fail to understand is that the Bitcoin world is accretive. And so what do I mean by that? Well, now our money is losing, let's call it 5% a year, every year. So I have to make at least 5% to even break even and get, get to start generating positive returns. Bitcoin has a baked in increase because it's pricing in all of the productivity and the productivity is going up. And so any additional Bitcoins that I earn past zero percent are then added on to that productivity. So if I hold Bitcoin and it, and productivity is going up at 10% every year, why well, get a 10% increase in my Bitcoin's value? If I'm receiving another 1% of Bitcoin onto my stack, well, then I'm getting the 10% plus the 1%. So now I'm returning 11%. So this is why I say generating positive returns in Bitcoin terms is the only metric that matters. Because if I can hold Bitcoin and outperform you, I'm just going to hold Bitcoin. If your Bitcoin results in me getting less Bitcoin over time, why would I give you my Bitcoin? And so what we've taken here at, at uh, Cater Capital as our thesis is what's the most lucrative investment in, and maybe not the most, but what's a hyper lucrative investment in the Bitcoin world? Well, it would be consistently profitable cash flowing companies that are f cash flowing Bitcoin to you. They, they produce cash flows like the sun rises in the morning. And so imagine if you as a market participant owned 10 businesses that all pumped out Bitcoin cash flow to you every month. You would love that, right? Because you then you can own more Bitcoin over time. Logically. So we've taken the angle that also everything falls down to proof of work because that's the foundation of the world is Bitcoin and Bitcoin runs on proof of work. And so investing is much the same. How are you proving your work? And cash flow to us is proof of work. You're demonstrating to the market that you're profitable and you're, you're providing free cash flows to your investors, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to own those types of businesses and that's what we're doing is we're owning those types of cash flowing, boring, Berkshire, Buffett and Munger-esque types of businesses, but there's a problem there. The problem is that to gain equity in and become owners of those businesses today, you have to run the opportunity cost of not using that capital to buy Bitcoin, right? So anybody that's bought even a, a cash, a cash flowing yeah. house, however long ago, 10 years ago, Tamas Palapatia bought a house. Well, that house has only gotten exponentially more expensive as the value of Bitcoin has increased. And so you would have been better off holding Bitcoin. So if I exchange $1 million today for a business versus $1 million today in Bitcoin, the $1 million in Bitcoin is going to outperform. And so the issue is how can we become owners of these businesses without shedding our Bitcoin stack. That's, can we do that first off? Uh, that's the question that uh, we pose at Gator Capital. And so we hunted down a, a bunch of different strategies and I won't get too deep into the weeds because I don't want to give away all the goodies, but we've essentially found a way to gain equity and become owners in these types of cash flowing businesses without shedding our Bitcoin stack. And in fact, the numbers that we've run, we've actually increased our Bitcoin stack and increased our equity in these types of businesses. And so what happens over time is you're, you're gaining ownership in these types of cash flowing businesses. These businesses are giving you cash flows and those are denominated in Bitcoin. We're on a Bitcoin standard and then we're using that Bitcoin as well to acquire more businesses, the more businesses that we have, the more cash flow that we receive, the more businesses we can own the more cash that we can receive. And so it becomes this positive flywheel effect. And in essence, that's how we become Bitcoin Berkshire, a massive conglomerate of cash flowing businesses providing a lifelong home to our investors. 
And in the Bitcoin world, this is again, hyper lucrative because the cash flows are not denominated in USD, mm. they're denominated in Bitcoin. And so yeah. we're earning the best possible thing that we can be earning. And it's basically like if we're Berkshire Hathaway, but we're on a Bitcoin standard. Berkshire Hathaway has a $266 billion treasury. They would, they would have earned, I think it was almost 5 million Bitcoins last year uh, in revenue. And that's just in one year, last year, 2023. Plus they have $266 billion uh, in just cash and cash equivalents and treasuries. Yeah. And so if you were to put Berkshire Hathaway, and that's the largest treasury in the market. The next closest is Apple at $177 billion. So if you to put Berkshire Hathaway on a Bitcoin standard, imagine they have about 70 cash flowing businesses that are consistently profitable, generating free cash flows. If you were to put Berkshire Hathaway on a Bitcoin standard, they would be the greatest business in the world. And really, they are the greatest Bitcoin business in the world. They just don't know it yet. Well, it's too hung up on it being rat poison and etc. But I was the old in with the new. So we're becoming the Bitcoin Berkshire and that's what we're doing at Gator Capital and that's what I'm building. Yeah, very cool, man. I love I love that idea. I uh I I think it also makes sense and I love what you said about um the the trade off between buying Bitcoin now or investing and then over the long run earning, I think that's a very important decision to make, right? Because you, yes. you, you want to keep investing in good businesses in general. Um, if we all just go to Bitcoin and don't do that anymore, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a good thing, but, um, yeah, you don't have to share the strategy, but I think it's interesting right. that it is a very hard, it, it's a hard game. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think I think it's really cool. It's a it's a it's a big play. Yeah, I'm excited for it. And you know, some people take the stance that investing in a Bitcoin world doesn't exist. It's like no, investing. What Bitcoin does is it saves investing because now it's speculative, and we have to use it basically as a replacement for savings. Bitcoin saves it because if as long as we're getting some sort of return back, okay, then we can be confident that we can allocate our money there. And so that's when it comes down to, okay, proof of work investing. What's your proof of work? Because if you don't have proof of work, then it becomes speculative and those investments don't necessarily completely go away, but it, it really funnels towards proof of work investing because as an investor, I know I can hold my Bitcoin and get that baked in productivity increase to my Bitcoin holdings. So if I part ways with a highly risky, highly speculative, basically zero proof of work business, I'm risking my Bitcoin stack and losing that baked in increase. Whereas if I see you have proof of work, you're generating 10 Bitcoins of free cash flow a month. Okay. I can see that and confidently invest. And so it just, it saves investing. It it takes it back to proof of work and really everything in the world is falling down to that base layer of proof of work. And obviously investing would be included in that as well. It's this, it's it's what we talked about uh, just now, but at a different level, right? It's the yes. do you want to part ways with your Bitcoin? Yeah, for for what you know? And and here the question is: Well, should I invest in a business or should I invest in Bitcoin? I, I, eventually, it's the same. It comes down to the same thing. But once you create an interesting enough alternative, then you know there's still risk, of course. But yes. um, um, yeah, interesting path, man. Very cool. I yeah. uh, I also want to ask you, how do you think future generations will look at this this current period of Bitcoin adoption, and what do you think they will think is the biggest impact? Ooh, good question. Really good question. I think uh, almost certainly they'll laugh at <laughs> for one how obvious it was, and two that we live in a world where prices went up over time. And we just sat there and accepted it. At least the majority of people do today. So what, how did you even, how did you accept that? And it's so illogical. How is productivity increasing? Technology is advancing. We're getting better at making things, but prices are going up. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. And then what is the biggest impact? 
I think things becoming affordable and abundant and really allowing us to actually gain more time because the money that we earn and save in appreciates in value. And so what they'll look back on and say was the biggest impact was our time and really Bitcoin granting us back our time to go and build families, to spend time with our families, to pursue our creative curiosities and our passions and true enthusiasms and the things that we really enjoy and love doing and not having to worry about paying bills off and working more and more jobs to pay off the life that's becoming more and more expensive. And instead we have to, we don't have to spend as much time essentially slaving away to earn money to pay off the life that's getting more expensive. We can spend less time to, you know, pay off the life that's getting cheaper. And so we don't have to spend as much time. Yeah. And I think time is our most precious asset. And to have that stolen from us is a great evil and to have it granted back to us and have it really freed is the ultimate benefit for us. Yeah, I, I saw this meme last week where uh, it's like a child asking his father, like, did, did Bitcoin <laughs> always trade at $5 million? And then you see the dad say like, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no, son, <laughs> you know, like those were di there were different times before you but uh yeah it's uh it's i agree with they're gonna look back and be like were you crazy like what are you <laughs> doing what what are you doing and right. uh i think the example of everything should become you know just jeff booth again like you know should fall to the marginal cost of production i uh, have the example exactly. of bread right like why isn't bread free uh, how how is it possible that 50 years ago a bread was 25 cents and now it's four dollars yeah. yeah you know that i think like, that's such an exemplary and good example uh, i i agree and jeff Woods is i think one of the brightest and smartest minds in the space and i've really appreciated his take on it from a technological uh, and deflationary perspective i've learned a lot from him i think i want to mention that there will come a generation in the future where Bitcoin will be money and that's all they will know. And that's all that will be. They'll know nothing else and it will be obvious. And it is your responsibility to stack on their behalf. I think yeah. it's, it's like, it will be so obvious in the future that, Bitcoin was adopted as money because it is the best transfer value across space scales and time. And that's all we're trying to solve with money. And because it does that, it wins as money. And that will, there will come a time when it'll just be money. It's like, you know, we woke up and I was five years old. We were just using dollars. I knew nothing else. It's yeah, like, exactly. That's just what, but that's also just this, what I'm, I'm thinking about if I do great work now, mm -hmm. then it makes personal sense to me that I would be able to spend that reward with the same purchasing power in 10 years for my kids. Just the concept Logically. of that <laughs> should exist. No, because if I'm forced to spend it right now before I have a family, what is the point of having a family, <laughs> right? Like that, that's, right. I think, how the thinking also eventually goes, right? There's yeah. so many people that decide not to have kids. Yeah. Right now, because exactly because they, they're expensive. It's like, but also they discount the future even more, right? That's what Save Dean talks about with yes. high and low time preference, right? The future is uncertain for everyone. So everyone discounts the future in a sense. You know, the, the, there is already an incentive to enjoy now more than save for later, just because of the nature of mm -hmm. the uncertainty of the future, yeah. right? But because we use the wrong money, that gets amplified That's up so to true. the point that people don't even want to have kids. Exactly. And people are like, well, why is the population rate in most countries declining? 
Well, it's because exactly for that reason, we, yeah, the, the, you know, kids are the most beautiful thing ever bringing new life to this world. I mean, that's just the best thing ever. And it's also in essence, a duty as a human. But when those kids for like a return, the cost to provide for them and, and to pay for them to eat and be nurtured and have a shelter becomes more and more expensive. Well, they, then they just become in some people's eyes, a burden. And they, they don't want to take that on. I'm already working two jobs just to pay the bills. You're expecting me to have another kid to care for and provide for. And they're just not going to have the kid. Yeah. And that's, it's destroying humanity. We need humans to exist as a human species. And like I said, like to me, it's so funny. This is a topic. Don't you think <laughs> what it, you just said? Like, We need humans for humans to survive. Yeah, logically, yeah. and and but so it's wild. We, why why are we here? You know, yeah. why are well, how did we end up at this point? Because I, I mean, it, it all works out for the better in the long run, and, and we'll we'll fix things because of Bitcoin, thankfully. But it's like to me the 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 thing that I'm most passionate about is is starting and building a family, and like it. I can be confident that I can go out and provide for that family because I own Bitcoin. I don't have to have an uncertain future. And so when, when all of humanity is able to do that and they're able to provide a loving and nurturing home for kids and then we can start to fix everything. And it just fixes Bitcoin fixes pretty much everything and comes from low time preference and being able to save and plan for our future confidently versus doing the opposite having life become more expensive is is a burden and it yeah. leaks into everything yeah. and uh it's really like you know save in u.s dollars life becomes more expensive save in bitcoin life becomes more affordable your choice love that so and we touched on this a bit the uh, kind of like philosophical part but uh how how do you think bitcoin will eventually win like What does yeah. it mean when Bitcoin is the foundation of our world or our society? Like what, yeah. what will happen? I think what it means when it's the foundation is that it's a global unit of account and medium of exchange. So practically everywhere there, you know, there might be some indigenous tribes and things of that nature that survive, but basically where you go everywhere, everything's denominated in Bitcoin, everyone everywhere uses Bitcoin. Well, then how does it get to that point? Because that's basically the end game. That's the final domino. And Bitcoin wins again, because it is the best transfer of value across space scales and time. So if you present a market over a long enough time frame with two options to basically store your value in option A, you lose value at 5% a year. Option B, you grow let's say even at 20% every year, more and more people are going to wake up to the realize to the fact that option B is the better choice. And so when you understand that Bitcoin is option B, quite literally B for Bitcoin and everything else is option A, Bitcoin outperforms everything else. Everything trends towards zero against Bitcoin over a long enough time frame, people are going to understand I can store my value most effectively in option B. I'm going to chew up, choose option B to the yep. point where people are going to say, don't pay me an option A because I'm only getting option A to store it in option B. I only want option B. People are going to start businesses and they're going to say, yeah, I don't want, I don't want option A. I'm accepting option, option B. Yep. Governments are, you know, and it really destroys the, the modern day nation state, but governments are, not going to want their shitty fiat currencies. They're going to want option B and really most more specifically on the government uh, point is that politicians, because they're incentivized and incentives around the world, because politicians are incentivized to get elected as more and more people wake up to the beauty and brilliance of option B politicians are going to cater to those people that believe in option B. And so then the people making the rules and governing us are also going to cater rules and governance to option B. And so yep. you have this, again, black hole, all, everything is funneling into option B 
because it is the be- it, like it's because it is the best transfer of value across space scales and time, and most specifically time. Because any logical market participant wants to store their value that they've earned the best over time. Yeah, that's that's why it wins. It's kind of like the black hole of incentives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. Um, it's just the black hole of everything. Well, I agree. And this is also why Bitcoin for me is so entertaining. Like I love just what you said now. I would love to see that play out. I yeah. will follow this for the rest of my life to see how this will play yeah. out. You know, we're and, seeing it play out. I mean, we're in, we're in maybe the most significant time period in human history. And I, I like, mm-hmm. I think these years right now, starting in, I mean, you can argue 1971, but I think really 2008, October 31st, Satoshi releases the Bitcoin white paper. Starting then, really until the fiat beast dies and the Bitcoin phoenix rises from the ashes, I think these are all-time years in the uh, all-time history books. I think yeah. these are these are these are years that will go down in the all-time history books and and we're living in it right now and it's so invigorating and exciting exciting i love that i love that thought i also entertain i also think it does hold people back in a way because it's such a big hyperbolic explanation right (laughs) um that it's very hard to realize that we are living through that and I, i had someone say to me like yeah but even in second world war or the 1918 the the plague or any huge events people were also living and they didn't realize that 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 this event or chain of events that they were living through would end up in the old time history books right right? yeah but that is that is uh eventually that was the case right and i agree i think it's also in this period maybe Maybe it'll be a hundred years, right? I don't know, 1971 to, to 2071, something like that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not going to see that, I think, but... Uh, you never know. That, w- that would be amazing, yeah. But th- this is also why it's just so fun to talk about and <laughs> fun yeah. to investigate more, right? Like yeah. once you once you think or are convinced that that could actually happen... Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, yeah. I latched on, right? Like this is the this is the thing. Yeah, um, gives you yeah. hope. It's like it gives you. Yes, exactly. Optimism and like hope is freaking everything. It's like if, dude, if we didn't have Bitcoin, it would just be a state of despair. And like, how do we get out of this rut and, and this evil system? Yeah, that steals our time, energy, and, and monetary value. It would, be, it would be depressing, and and all of these things that are happening right the increase in depression rates for example they would continue on and thank god for bitcoin because we have hope now that we can fix this and start reversing things yeah and unlock the infinite amount of prosperity awaiting us i think i know the answer but do you see bitcoin as just technology or also a philosophy and can you share a bit about how both (laughs) i think it is a monetary technology. It is a technological innovation, innovation for money. That's what Satoshi brought to the market on the backs of other test runs from programmers prior to presenting uh, that presented forms of digital money to the market that failed. Well, as any innovation goes, people iterate and they fail and the market learns and they, they fix those failures and Satoshi was able to put all the pieces together and he might not have understood fully the significance of what he created, but he did. He innovated this thing and he harnessed ideas and code, put it together into a protocol. And here, here we are today, but philosophically, it's like, we just had a, you know, we're having a philosophical discussion right now around Bitcoin and and money, you know, really is just a medium of exchange at the end of the day. But, you know, the philosophical ramifications from what money is 
and all of the implications of what money we choose to save in and what money we choose to spend in, who can control the money. Those are all philosophical discussions and what we do with our money and the impact that it has. So I think it's both. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. I love I love this part of of Bitcoin because there's also I don't know about you, but there has not this this topic or this technology has triggered me to research so many other topics and really I don't know, kind of like embrace my curiosity in all these other things and I think in essence philosophy is about that, right? You're trying to understand the essence of you know whatever subject um, you pick, mm-hmm. and as I think we talked about for the past ninety minutes, when you mm-hmm. talk about money and value and energy, like all the, all these things touch each other, and there's all these peripheral uh, so there's all that stuff around that that also touches each other but eventually i think the center of it is that it touches your individual life yes. right and that once you see that there are certain tools you use whether it's the tool of money or how conscious you are of the future or how much you discount time right being aware mm-hmm. of your own time preference uh realizing that you don't know what you want to do, right? Or ask the question, what am I here to do? Actually, like, you know, how can I create time to figure that out? Like all, the, all these things, you know, um, I think are, are very much all about how do I live my life? How do I us- utilize the time yes. that I've been given? I don't know how much it is, but that's why it's so important to figure that out for yourself, right? Yeah. And to, to keep talking about it and keep thinking about it and reflecting on it and talking with other people, right? Because eventually that is, I think where the value is. We no no one has a clue. Everyone's figuring it out. (laughs) Everyone is winging it. Right. Yes. And so by talking like this, you know, each time you will find one, two, three, these new little hooks for you to explore further or think about and develop, you know, your own rationale about how you want to, live the yeah. finite time that you've been given, right? Exactly. And I, I, that's what, you know, Bitcoin fixes that as well. It's like, you, once you have more time to think about and ponder over and explore what you actually want to do with your time, because the, the reflection of your time spent and given and provided to the market is actually going up in value, which is granting you more time. Well, then you can go out and learn more about what you actually want to do and for any individual, it's like, man, that's what more can you ask for? It's like to really come down to your true heart's screen and your heart's path and, and call uh, to the universe and the universe is called to you. It's like, you can get on that path. That's, that's it. That's, that's, that's what we're after. Love that. Um, Two last questions. How, if, if you have to, if you, if you look back at your journey into Bitcoin up until now, what's, what's been your biggest change in world view or views in general, if, if any mm. true understanding Bitcoin? How broken the world is right now. I think learning about what money is obviously played into that, but learning about the nature of our broken money right now and how that leaks into everything. You can see it everywhere. The lighting that we use, these bright fluorescent LED cheap light bulbs that suck the soul out of us, the industrial sludge that's all over grocery stores and restaurants, the destruction of the family unit, our failure to provide adequate educations individualized educations to our generations, the burdening of more and more debt and a more expensive life to our future generations. And like seeing how it's that broken money is connected to everything. And then 
on the other side, having the hope that we can fix all of this through Bitcoin. It's like both of those things are extremely profound uh, realizations and understandings and lenses to see the world through. And they're contrasted with each other in this explosively uh, positive, but again, profound way. And uh, just to, to have a conversation like this and to be on Twitter and really just to be in the world and to look around and know that we have hope for all of this stuff to get fixed through Bitcoin, it's, uh, it's peaceful, but it, it brings me a lot of, you know, energy and enthusiasm and really, again, hope, I think is the same word and, and Bitcoin is hope. And, and, uh, again, if we didn't have it, we, we might be hopeless, but yep. we have it. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question. What is a core belief that you will never let go? Yeah, it's to embrace your weirdness. I think everyone on this earth is weird at their nature. And normal means to conform to a standard. And so when we try to be normal, we're actually robbing ourselves of ourselves, conforming to what we think is okay or acceptable. And we're distancing ourselves from our true nature. And so when you embrace your weirdness, and for me, this was deciding to go left instead of going right and going down the college path. When I started to explore my true nature and what I was really after and curious about, it's like all of these beneficial things and learnings and discoveries and, you know, trials and tribulations as well that I've learned from, have all sprouted from you know, embracing my weirdness and exploring my weirdness at the same time. It's like, be strange, like embrace your strangeness. And I was at a conference this past weekend and this guy, Tyler taught who's on Twitter and is just one of the best human beings ever. He gave a, a presentation and he's one of the things he said was the be strange and love that and love that about yourself and present your strangeness to the world because that's what makes you, you. And so it, it, Explore it, embrace it, and love it, and uh, watch how far it takes you. It's a fun journey. Amazing, man. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for your time. This was a great uh, impromptu podcast. I really, yeah. really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks you for will. sharing your thoughts, and uh, we'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again, Brian. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.